Hey, welcome back. Uh, my name is Jeff Fuller. You are listening to Jay Fuller Interviews. Jay Fuller Interviews. Subscribe on YouTube. We're also on Facebook. Join the Facebook group, Jay Fuller Interviews. On Instagram and Twitter, Jay Fuller Interviews. And now on all the podcast channels as the Backfire Podcast with Jeff Fuller of Jay Fuller Interviews. I believe people's stories make our stories much better, less ignorant, certainly more impactful. And one with a great story is uh, Matt Doherty. Matt, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Jeff. I appreciate you having me on, and uh, I appreciate all you've done for our country as you served uh, in the military. Thank you so much for doing that for me and my family and uh, everybody else in this, uh, this country. Yeah, we're excited uh, to have you share some of your story. And as I mentioned to you off air, I've uh, been privileged to have Steve Hale join and Buzz Peterson and Growing up in Vermont, when you're in fifth grade and you have to pick a team, uh, UVM Catamounts weren't that great. And so I had an uncle uh, just outside of Asheville in Hendersonville, North Carolina. So I said the Tar Heels, and I've uh, been a fan ever since. You are not from North Carolina. When you were recruited by the Tar Heels, was there any apprehension on your part for going there? You know, back then, uh, North Carolina was a long way from New York. I grew up on Long Island, uh, but there was such a tradition of New Yorkers going to the University of North Carolina and playing and having success uh, that it wasn't that intimidating. Uh, being nine and a half hours away from home was a little different um, at first. Uh, you know, like every kid, I think you get homesick that first semester. But there were so many good players before me dating back to – Frank McGuire's 57 national championship team when the starting five was from New York City. Uh, and then they had uh, Mitch Kupchak, who's now the general manager of the Hornets, was from Long Island. Chris Brust, who was a teammate of mine, was from Long Island. Jimmy Black is from the Bronx. Michael Coyne was from New Jersey. Uh, so there were so many players before me that, you know, took that uh, – that pipeline down to Chapel Hill and had success and, 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 and enjoyed uh, the opportunity to, to uh, go to a beautiful school uh, that had a great academic reputation and um, a great basketball reputation. And also you get to play for a legend, Dean Smith. Well, I was just going to ask that without uh, social media or media in general, like it is now, what did you know about coach Smith? Yeah, well, Back then, uh, I knew he coached the 76 Olympics because I was in eighth grade in 1976. And then in 77, he coached uh, in the final four. And that's when Michael Korn was a freshman. So that's kind of when I fell in love with North Carolina basketball in 76, 77. So back then, it was Sports Illustrated article. You know, the New York Post, the Daily News, um, it, that, that's how you, you know, that word of mouth, um, those, that's how you've got information on coaches. So yeah, I remember, um, when I was maybe a freshman and coach William was in his office back in Carmichael and he was the fourth assistant for Dean Smith at the time or the third assistant. He'd be down going through all the newspapers and cutting out articles to send to recruits. <laughs> you know, you just think about that. Yeah. And there'd be a big stack of he'd get newspapers throughout the state of North Carolina delivered to Chapel Hill, and he'd rifle through the articles and he'd cut out the articles and make photocopies and send those out to the recruits. Photocopy. Yeah. Xerox machines. What a concept. Yeah, what a concept, and uh, certainly the hard work uh, seemingly paid off, and now the reputation Carolina has is phenomenal. I just wanted to go to this. Uh, this is your website, CoachMattDoherty.com, and uh, you said in there, uh, you've said before that sometimes your greatest strength is also your greatest weakness, and uh, you are certainly fiery and tense, but sometimes maybe you would admit that came back to bite you or just talk about that drive or what you mean by your greatest strength can also be your greatest weakness. Well, I think, uh, I think that we all have this, um, I'd call it an emotional uh, barrier and that 
you know, we are who we are, and we have a default. We all have a default, you know, in terms of who we are, how we are, our emotional state. I'm pretty emotional. I'm pretty fiery. Coach Williams is pretty emotional, pretty fiery. Um, and and so, you know, if you become too emotional, too fiery, uh, that's not good. You stay within that boundary, that circle, and you manage it. And that's the emotional intelligence part, Jeff, that I didn't understand in 2003. Um, to be aware of your emotions and how they impact others. And so, you know, I like to play with a high level of intensity. Um, that's the only way I could be successful because I wasn't very athletic. So I had to play that way. And then I felt I had to coach that way. And um, sometimes that wasn't good because it was too too intense. Um, I, I didn't let up on the gas pedal. Hmm. I need to sometimes pull up off the, the, the gas and let the car coast a little bit. I wasn't real good at that. I got better at it uh, because one thing I believe, Jeff, is that leadership is a learned behavior. And after I lost my job in 2000. In three at North Carolina, I went on a leadership journey and studied uh, and, and learned about emotional intelligence and, and learned that leadership is a learned behavior. And that's why I have the Doherty coaching practice now is because um, I made a lot of mistakes and, and I learned from them and try to grow from them. And um, yeah, so sometimes, you know, if you're an aggressive, confrontational coach, that could be a good thing, but too much of it is a bad thing. I mean, you know, you look at coaches like Greg Marshall at Wichita State. Very intense, very intense, very intense. Well, it bit him in the butt. Um, yeah. And then you have coaches that are laid back or people that are laid back. Well, if you're too laid back, you're considered soft and not driven. And so uh, finding that balance is so critical uh, and staying within that emotional circle um is, is vital and i think to do that you need quality people around you that can help you stay in that center of that emotional circle coach let's back up a little bit uh when you grew up in new york city did you have any siblings what was your home life like yeah i grew up actually on long island uh 30 miles outside of the city um south shore of long island i had three older sisters a younger brother my dad uh, drove a truck. He owned a Pepsi route in New York City. My mom uh, was a homemaker. Um, I was the fourth of five. I tell my younger brother he was a mistake, that he was not supposed to arrive. Uh, but the Irish, uh, Irish Catholic method of birth control is not real good, Jeff. And uh, six years later, I had a younger brother. And my sisters were excited. I wasn't excited as much. Um, uh, but now jokingly, uh, yeah, we had a great family and, um, I was really blessed to grow up blue collar, South shore, you know, dad signed me up for baseball, for basketball. Um, we had great sports teams and, and athletes to model. Um, I love hockey. I love baseball. I love basketball. I love football. And in New York, we had Every every you had a team for every season. Correct, right? you had two teams for every season. And uh, then I had great coaching on Long Island. All the class because you had first generation New York City guys teaching us. And one of those who really impacted my life was Bob McKillop, who's now the head coach at Davidson. Hmm. He was my high school coach for two years before he went to become an assistant at Davidson, and then he came back at a rival high school. So I was really blessed to have a lot of great coaches that uh, taught me the fundamentals of the game. And we had parks to play in that taught me how to compete. You know, and if in New York, if you wanted to stay in the court, you had to win. <laughs> how tall did you end up? I'm um, six. Uh, I was listed at six, eight as a senior in college, but I'm, I'm six, seven. So did, uh, did you have I was a was a freshman in high school. Okay, did you have a growth spur in middle school? I was always tall. Okay. Yeah, I was always, you know, back of the line. You know, when the people said line up in height order, I just went to the back. <laughs> and, and, and usually I was the last one in line. 
did you ever feel i have a friend he's six eight and in vermont it's different because we don't have a lot of tall guys i guess but he always said he heard fans saying it's not fair because he's so tall he's kind of a bully out there and he said he had to work through just figuring out this is how god created him this is what he was going to do and make the most of his body his size what identity crisis maybe did you go oh, through i loved it i love being tall um I, 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 I wouldn't trade it for the world. Um, I, I always wanted to be six, seven. Um, as weird as that sounds, I grew up being a Rick Barry fan and Rick Barry was six, seven. And I had a poster of him on my wall. And I thought that that was the optimum height for basketball because he could do everything. And so uh, I love being tall. I love standing out. It helped me as a basketball player, but also prided myself on not being a big stiff. Hmm. Uh, I wanted to be one that could be coordinated and handle the ball and run. And, you know, people say, oh, you're a big geek or a gork or whatever, uncoordinated, and I'd love to prove them wrong, and I'd handle the ball, and I'd, you know, I could outrun a lot of people. Um, and so I just took a lot of pride in um, being – Ball, but being coordinated. And one of the things, Jeff, that I focused on at a young age was playing with older guys. So in the summer times and after school, you know, I would I would play with guys that were two to four years older than me, sometimes a lot older. Yeah. Um, and so I wasn't always the tallest player on the, on the court. And that really helped me, I think, uh, uh, become – you know, more skilled and diverse as a player as opposed to just being the tallest guy and stuck around the basket. So um, I, I, I love being tall. I wouldn't have played with for anything. Now, when did you realize that you had opportunity to play in college and what other schools were you looking at besides Carolina? Yeah. Excuse me. Um <clears throat> My first recruiting letter was in ninth grade hmm. from the University of Tennessee. And I played on, a, on the varsity as a freshman, and we had a good team. Bob McKillop was my high school coach, as I stated earlier, who's now the head coach of Davidson. So we had players. He had players that had been recruited already. So um, playing as a freshman on the varsity – it's kind of a big deal. So I started getting letters as a freshman. So I felt at that point, you know, I'd have a good chance to get a college scholarship. Just didn't know at what level. And um, so I just kept, you know, trying to get better and better. And um, uh, eventually narrowed the, my list down to four schools, which is uh, Notre Dame, Duke, Virginia, North Carolina. Um as an Irish Catholic kid from Long Island, being recruited by Notre Dame was special. Yeah. Um, and I was a big fan of Kelly Trapucia and some of the teams that they had back in the late 70s. Um, and then uh, I really wanted to play in the league. And uh, the Big East had just formed in like 1979. But I felt the best basketball was in the ACC and also felt – one of the best schools in the ACC, and also like the weather. Um, it was big time basketball, great weather, great schools. Um, and you know, fortunately, I was able to by those schools and felt that at North Carolina, we had the best chance to win the national championship. Uh, with that comes the risk of playing time. And a funny story, Jeff, is in the home visit, a lot of coaches would say, Hey, uh, you know, we think you play a lot. You make big impact as a freshman. Um, and then when it came to Dean Smith's interview, uh, home visit, the concept of discussion playing time came up, and he said, "You know, um, you'd be lucky to play by the time you're a junior." And I, I remember leaning forward and saying to myself, "I'll tell you." And so. You know, he, he set expectations differently than a lot of other coaches. And I think he took that as a challenge. You know, let's see if these guys would accept that challenge. Um, and, and, you know, I did. And I was a six-man as a freshman and started as a sophomore. 
<laughs> Matt Doherty, uh, generous with his time this morning with us. Uh, you are listening to the Backfire Podcast on Apple iTunes, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Also on Jay Fuller Interviews on YouTube and the Facebook group as well. Uh, coach, when did you realize you wanted to become a coach? Is that something you always knew going in? No, I really didn't want to coach. Um, I wanted to play. And then when I got cut by the uh, Cleveland Cavaliers, I really wanted to get away from basketball um, because I felt like it was a, a, I was a foreign lover. And um, and then I quit my job in New York City, moved to Charlotte to get into the real estate business. And when I moved to Charlotte, I started working part-time for a gentleman named Ed Stockwell. And Ed coached an AAU team. Uh, and he had an eighth grade team, and he let me coach the team. And I coached the team with a gentleman named Charles Waddell, who played football and basketball in North Carolina. And I loved it. I loved the practices. I loved being around the players. I loved the games. Uh, and that's when I realized I wanted to coach. And at that, at the end of that summer, um. That next year, yeah, I was doing the radio at Davidson. And then after that season, they made a coaching change. And that's when they hired Bob McKillop. And I joined Bob's staff. Hmm. Hey, Coach, uh, you shared before when you were on radio with me several years ago when you were at SMU, how it was difficult for you, but you also had a sense of pride seeing Carolina win that championship after uh, you had left. Right. Can you just share, I mean, there's so many questions here, but just with McCants and those guys that you recruited, um, what was that recruiting process like for you? I imagine you weren't cutting articles out of newspapers and uh, mailing them to players. But um, I guess the first question is, when you signed those guys or had them sign, how exciting was that for you, knowing that they were going to be a great nucleus for the future? Yeah, you know, you, you, you think they're going to be great. You just don't know how good. Um and they were certainly talented. Uh, that their freshman year, I started three freshmen and two sophomores. And two years later, that group, that, that same starting five, won the national championship. And back then, it was kind of unheard of starting three freshmen. I mean, besides the Fab Five, no one really started that many freshmen. And so I knew they had to grow, um, and they were talented, and we had some big wins. Um, that year we beat Kansas in Madison Square Garden. We beat we beat Duke at home without Sean May, um, and unfortunately Sean got hurt at Christmas time. Um, so yeah, recruiting them, you know you you know it. it, it first of all, North Carolina is a, an easy it's, it's maybe the best product in college basketball, and and then you just had a place put the vision in their mind of the opportunity and <clears throat> you had to, you know, show how they fit in. And, and, um, you know, we had some great talent and great leaders. Uh, Raymond was a great talent, a great leader. Sean May, Rashad was certainly talented. And then I thought it was really critical that the upper class at that time, Jawad Williams and Jackie Manuel, uh, embrace those new players, uh, and they did, and they became a very cohesive group that uh, um, led to um, one player. I'd like to give a lot of credit to in recruiting is Jeff Baker, who mm -hmm. is an upperclassman. And you know, players aren't going to come to a school unless they're comfortable with the existing players, and your existing players are your best salesmen. And Jeff. Uh, I'm sorry, Jason, Jason Caper, Jeff's the head coach of Pittsburgh, and played with Jason, his brother. Um, Jason was really a good guy that I think all the recruits can relate to. And, um, and, and I think that he was just going to make me so comfortable when I'm a recruiting coach. Who is a recruit that you thought you had, but they chose another school? Wow. That's a great question. Uh, two come to mind. Um, Jason Frazier, who went to Villanova, was considered the number one recruit in that same class. 
Well, I mean, we were trying to break in a Fab Five in that class. Uh, and then Brett Buckman. Uh, uh, Brett played at Texas. He was from Austin. Okay. And, um, you know, it's hard to pull a kid away from the University of Texas who lives in Austin, whose dad and mother, I think, both went to UT. Yeah. But we were close. I think those two uh, players off the top of my head when I was at uh, North Carolina were the two players that, you know, if we got those guys, then we would have had a five five. Yeah, but hey, Coach, this might sound like a gotcha question. I hope it isn't, but Carolina, the story is that once you're there, you're always family. For you playing there, then coaching there, but then how you left, is there that still family feel, or is that still a bit of bitterness or a resentment with how things all played out? No, that's a great question and a fair question. I think an insightful question, Jeff. Um, I felt like the black sheep of the family for a while. Um, and maybe some of that was real or some of that's my insecurity. Um, but when you, you know, you, you're a starter on a national championship team, Dean Smith's first team, you, you're the head coach of Notre Dame, you asked to come back and help the program and need you do. And then three years later, you're forced to resign, you know, and there's a lot of resentment in the, in the, in the program because, you know, I didn't retain some of the assistant coaches that had played there. That was probably one of the biggest things. Um, you know, then rumors start, and it's hurtful. Um, but, you know, you, you know, life's hard. And so, you know, there were certainly things that I would have done differently. Matter of fact, Jeff, I'm coming out with a book in March called Rebound, from Pain to Passion. Great. And it talks a lot about these things, what I learned, what I would have done differently. You know, I, 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 I would have managed Coach Smith differently. You know, even though he wasn't officially an AD or anything like that, I would have managed that differently. I would have kept the previous staff on and brought my staff with me in a different capacity. But all those things were happening so fast. It was yeah. June 11th that I got the job. I mean, right. I mean, July 11th. People don't really forget. You know, it's not like I got the job uh, in March or April and had time to figure things out. I'm, I've got the job in the beginning of the recruiting period. Right. So, you know, I made some mistakes, but it's kind of unprecedented. You know, not many people get to follow a Dean Smith and a Bill Guthrie, you know, that played there. You know, the only people that have done something similar were people that have followed John Wood. And they're still trying to replace John <laughs> Wood. And I feel sorry for the next coach at Duke because it's going to be a similar situation in Durham. Yeah, that's so true. Hey, on a lighter note, why did you choose number 44? I chose number 44 because I thought it was a really cool number. Um, Reggie Jackson was a uh, – I was a fan of Reggie Jackson and, and the Yankees. Um, Kelly Chapuka wore that number um, at Notre Dame. Uh, Adrian Dantley wore that number at Notre Dame. Pete Maravich wore that number. Jerry West wore that number. I thought it was a really cool number. Um, 31 and 30 were the numbers I wore in high school, and 30 was taken by Al Wood. And 31 was Michael Corn's number. And I was, I love Michael Corn, um, but I didn't want to take his number because I didn't want people to think I was trying to be too much like Michael Corn. You know, <laughs> and I probably would never have been able to sell his team. So, Coach, you've had opportunity to coach with and coach against some of the greats. And uh, just your. Uh, story, your journey has led you to some remarkable places. When you look back, um, how grateful are you for the time in which you lived and those opportunities that came your way? Yeah, you know, I, I think I need to look back with more gratitude. I think that's a problem I have. Um, I think one thing as a coach and as a player, you're always looking for the next game, the next season. And you don't really take the time to enjoy 
what you've been through, you know, and, and, you know, listen, I got fired basically from North Carolina and fired from SMU. So yeah, I had some great experiences, but also been fired. So that's a bitter taste. And, you know, so, you know, sometimes it's hard for me to look back and say, man, I had a pretty good run as a college player and a college coach. Uh, and be grateful for that. And I should be. I, I need to be. You have a cross on the back wall here, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. I, I should, you know, and, and, and you know, this past Sunday and uh, Saturday, I, I, I've, I've been negligent with the Bible study, but um, at, at Sunday at church, they had a great, I'm, I'm looking it up right now, okay? I'm going to look it up. And uh, here we go. Okay. All right. I'm thankful for everything that makes me more like Jesus. Gratitude should be the response to the trial. See trials as a gift. Wow. And, and I think sometimes I don't do that. And I think we don't do that. Um, but, you know, Jesus went through a lot of trials. Yeah. Guy's gotten whipped. He had friends turn on him. He had to carry a cross. He got hung, uh, you know, uh, mounted to a cross. Um, so I try to, I need to do a better job of taking the things that have happened to me and be more Christ like in my walk. That's my goal. I'm not good at it, Jeff. I need help. But like, you know, I mean, I, I'm, th there's triggers. I call it the bitter river in my book. There's this river that I'm trying to cross. Hmm. Uh, and it's a, it's a bitter river. And you're on this road. There's no guardrail. But you're on this bridge. And all of a sudden, there might be a trigger. It might be a Carolina game on TV. It might be a contemporary getting a good coaching job. And I drive off the road into the bitter river. Hmm. That's not Christ-like, but we're flawed humans. And so I have to be more like, okay, take the high road, model the behavior I want my kid to see, and, and realize, okay, what, you know, Robin Roberts talked about make your mess your, your mess your message. Yeah, yeah. You know, my mess was getting fired at North Carolina. And make it my message. And that's what I'm trying to do with the Darty coaching practice. I think that's great. And, uh, Coach, thank you again for making the time. Just a couple quick questions, and we'll, we'll get you out. That uh, river of bitterness, um, that's so huge, and I think that's why uh, the Bible talks about us needing one another. Jesus is our Savior, but we certainly need the family just to help uh, get us through. Um, I just look back at uh, yourself and uh, how you played, but just realize that every step, especially during 2020, this pandemic is one where we need that emotional intelligence or new revelation or holding on to our faith. Uh, I see that you're active on Twitter and social media, and I ask this delicately, but I find it very uh, good and gracious that uh, you made a comment on Twitter. One of uh, the former Carolina players responded, and I don't know if it was Black Lives Matter or it was just something dealing with that and how you navigated that conversation. I thought it was with skill, but you did not lose uh, your integrity in doing so. How important is it that during this time we maintain integrity by sharing what we truly believe, but also showing grace and empathy to those that might be traveling a different way? A hundred percent. Um I'm 58. I've got kids. Um, I talk about leadership. And I think then it's important to lead. I think leadership is really lacking in our country. And I have beliefs. I, I, I'm on a conservative talk show on, on Thursdays. So I talk about these things and I try to formulate my beliefs, my belief system. And, 
And so I felt like I needed to put it out there. Like if I'm talking about it, I need to, I, I can't be afraid. And what I, what I like Jeff, is open debate, but it's got to be respectful debate. And I think what Twitter does, it creates this wall where we can hide behind and we can make comments that are very ugly and, and disrespectful. And that breaks down the opportunity to really cross the aisle, reach across the aisle and, and take a hand and have healthy debate. Yeah. So I don't mind poking the bear and throwing the topic out there. And I want to get to know why you believe what you believe. And I want you to listen to me and help me understand, help, help and, and learn why I believe what I believe. And in the process, I might come closer to your side of the aisle because yeah. it might make sense to me that I didn't think of. But I'm not going to listen if it's in a disrespectful manner. And you're not going to listen to me if I'm disrespectful. So I think it's so important that we do have these open conversations about race, about gender, about socioeconomic issues. But they've got to be taken in a respectful way. Right now, we have the far right and the far left. You're either with us or against us. And that's not healthy. That's not good. We need to come together as a country and we can have disagreements. We can, heck, we've got a country that's a melting pot. So we're going to have people with all different ideas and religious beliefs. And, but there's got to be some core values that we stand upon as a foundation of our country that we can count on each and every day that does make our country special. Yeah. And it's the reason why people want to live in America. But for us to continue to grow, we've got to extend a hand, open our hearts, open our minds to others. We can agree to disagree, but there's got to be more respect in our country. I certainly agree with that. Uh, Coach Matt Doherty, CoachMattDoherty.com is where you can find more information. And uh, Coach, I'm excited about the book that's coming out uh, next spring. And we'd certainly uh, love to have you back on and share that uh, at the appropriate time. But um, I'm just so grateful for yourself and others that have made the time just to share your story with me and uh, go online just so others can realize that uh, life is not perfect. Even for a UNC alum, a Division One college that's uh, had a lot of success, being open about the failures and about the disappointments is key, I believe, for us to uh, know that we're all in this together. But, um, Coach, final question for you is simply when or if, I'll say when, when the feature film comes out about your life, who plays you in that feature film? Uh, ben Affleck. There you go. <laughs> uh, that's good. That's a great one. Uh, Coach, we thank even you. Though, even though he's a damn Red Sox fan. <laughs> Well, I can't say much. I'm here in Vermont, so I've been holding. I know, I know, I know. I'll, for I'll forgive you. I'll forgive you, Jeff. Uh, Coach, thank you so much. We wish you all the best, and I uh, would love to stay in touch. Thanks so thank much. Thank you, Jeff. Again, that's Coach Matt Doherty making some time. You are listening to Jay Fuller Interviews on YouTube. You can certainly subscribe there. Join the Facebook group, also on Instagram and Twitter, Jay Fuller Interviews, and the Backfire Podcast with Jeff Fuller of Jay Fuller Interviews on Apple iTunes, Spotify, Anchor, and Google Podcasts. Thanks all. We wish you all the best. And uh, listen to someone's story and allow it to make your 